In the first phase of the scheme, with Churchill's approval, ten million dollars was released by the Treasury and deposited in a Swiss bank in New York. From this, selected Spanish generals were invited to make withdrawals in pesetas, with the balance to be paid after the war. Some two million dollars is thought to have been funneled to General Antonio Aranda Mata, who was expected to take over the army if Franco should fall. Another happy beneficiary was General Luis Orgaz Iyaldi, the commander of Spanish Morocco. Orgaz was being rewarded by both sides. The Abwehr promised him an amphibious car. It is probable that Admiral Moreno, the man who had negotiated the surrender of Menorca with Hilgarth, and had since been promoted to Navy Minister in Franco's government, was also on the payroll. The Admiral had long opposed Spanish involvement in the war. He kept Hilgarth abreast of the mood in Francoist government circles, reassuring him that if Germany ever invaded Spain there would be a general uprising. There was not a Spaniard who would not wish to fight if the Germans came in, he told Hilgarth. Hilgarth poured money into the pockets of sympathetic officers. The cavalry of St. George have been charging, noted Hugh Dalton, head of SOE and Minister for Economic Warfare. This was an oblique reference to the image of St. George slaying the dragon on the British gold sovereign. In September 1941, the scheme hit a snag. The Swiss account in New York was locked as part of the American freeze on European assets, but Hilgarth urgently needed reinforcements from St. George's cavalry. We must not lose them now, after all we have spent and gained, wrote Churchill, who sent an urgent appeal via Henry Morgenthau, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, to Roosevelt urging him to unfreeze the New York account. The sluice gates reopened. There is no documentary evidence that Roosevelt backed this campaign of corruption and subversion, but as the historian David Stafford notes, his approval can safely be assumed. The bribery scheme continued up to 1943, but whether the cavalry of St. George achieved anything is open to question. Many Spanish officers were already disinclined to become entangled in the war, and were naturally opposed to the fascists, fearing that German victory would mean servitude for Spain, and an end to the individual freedom which is as necessary as air to most Spaniards. Even Hilgarth acknowledged, with the sort of generalization beloved of certain Englishmen, that the Spaniard is xenophobic and suspicious and wants to keep clear of other people's quarrels. The money may simply have made the generals rich, and Juan March even richer, but it certainly reaffirmed Churchill's faith in his Madrid spymaster and paymaster. I am finding Hilgarth a great prop, he said. Hilgarth possessed, by his own account, a natural sympathy for Spain. Handling Spaniards is a special technique, he wrote. Everything in Spain is on a personal basis. He cultivated his contacts like an expert forester planting trees, propagating and nourishing them, metaphorically and literally, with large and lavish dinners. An intelligence officer, he once remarked, will be at a very definite disadvantage if he is a teetotaler. A good digestion is also important. Charming, polished, and speaking perfect Spanish, Hilgarth moved effortlessly through the Madrid elite, making contacts with generals, admirals, diplomats, and foreign newspaper correspondents. Even during the worst of the war, I had little difficulty in maintaining old friendships and making new ones, he recalled later. Hilgarth could call in, or buy in, favours from every level of Spanish officialdom. But perhaps his most useful agent, whom he ran in tandem with MI6, was Agent Andros, a senior officer in the Spanish Navy. Andros has never been identified. More than sixty years later, under Britain's draconian secrecy laws, MI6 will not divulge the name of the very reliable and well-placed straight agent called Andros, who obtained information of great value. Andros would also demonstrate his value as a double agent. In 1943, he was approached in Madrid by a senior officer of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the feared intelligence service of the SS, named Eugene Messig, who asked him to supply intelligence which he would send straight to Berlin, i.e. not through the German intelligence HQ in Madrid. The SD and the Abwehr were mutually suspicious rivals. C was initially dubious fearing that this might compromise a very valuable agent, but Hilgarth was keen to open a channel of disinformation into the SS. Andros accepted Messig's invitation and began feeding him nuggets of false information, selected by Hilgarth. 
The items were so chosen that the Germans would be bound to draw the deductions that we wanted. Andros, who also went by the code name Blind, proved a brilliant double agent, successfully passing on information indicating that the Spanish Navy had learned, through its own sources, that U-boats were liable to attack from British planes and submarines in Spanish waters. Messig swallowed the stories whole, was extremely pleased, and continually pressed for more. In order to mislead Messig, Andros must have had genuine access to top-grade Spanish intelligence. It was a delicate job. However, Andros was in particularly good position to inform Messig. The admission that Andros was in a particularly good position to misinform the Germans suggests that he may have been a senior figure within Spanish naval intelligence. Whoever Andros was, Hilgarth trusted him completely. The British and German spies circled one another, spitting like cats. Hilgarth knew that copies of all our telegrams were given to the Germans, and that the telephones in the embassy were being tapped. It seemed that the listening in was done by an Abwehr member, but it might have been done by a Spanish telephone operator. Abwehr wireless traffic made it clear that a senior Spanish official had been squared to allow the tapping. Hilgarth warned, only by naval ciphers can really safe messages be sent. Some of the Spanish staff at the embassy were suspected of being in German pay. One of the guards at the British embassy was suborned by a woman in German pay, but was intercepted before he could do much damage. Even so, he knew that the Germans kept lists of everyone who went in and out of the British embassy. Hilgarth relished the contest. The Germans would have someone following him, and he would have someone following the Germans— and found the constant surveillance by both Spanish and German spies quite amusing, since these were usually very amateurish and inefficient. Occasionally he would bump into Abwehr officers at official functions. Our deportment towards the German diplomats was to behave as if they did not exist. If we met them at a party, we ignored them. They did exactly the same to us. Madrid was the crucible of European espionage, and as chief among the British spies, Hilgarth found himself fielding some odd customers from the intelligence world. Dudley Wrangell Clark was the master of A-Force, based in Cairo, the unit devoted to deception operations in the Mediterranean. As the intelligence officer in overall command of deception for Operation Husky, Clark had been involved at every stage in the build-up to Operation Mincemeat, but Hilgarth had already come across him in a very different guise. In October 1941, he had bailed Dudley Clark out of a Spanish jail. There was nothing so odd in that. Hilgarth was often bailing people out of jail. What made the occasion special and acutely embarrassing was Colonel Clark's outfit. He was dressed as a woman. A Spanish police photograph shows this master of deception in high heels, lipstick, pearls, and a chic cloche hat, his hands in long opera gloves demurely folded in his lap. He was not even supposed to be in Spain, but in Egypt. In spite of the colonel's predicament, in the photo he seems thoroughly comfortable, even insouciant. His fellow spy chiefs were not. Guy Little of MI5 noted, The circumstances of his release were, to say the least of it, peculiar. At the time he was dressed as a woman complete with brazier, etc. It is the brazier, etc. that gives it away. What on earth was the blighter thinking of? A chap might go in disguise if needed, but in a brazier? The Spanish authorities seemed to find the incident equally amusing, and put out a propaganda leaflet, announcing that a man named Rangal Creca, who claimed to be the Times correspondent in Madrid, had been arrested, dressed as a woman. Having helped to get Clark out of prison, Hilgarth obtained the photographs of his colleague, both in and out of drag, and gleefully sent them to Churchill's personal assistant, Charles Tommy Thompson, who showed them to the Prime Minister. Hilgarth attached a deadpan note, but you can hear him snorting. Herewith some photographs of Mr. Dudley Wrangell Clark, as he was when arrested, and after he had been allowed to change. The after photograph showed Clark in his more usual bow-tie and jacket. P.M. has seen, said a note scrawled on Hilgarth's letter. Sadly, history does not relate Churchill's reaction to what he had seen. Word of the photograph spread around Whitehall. Some wondered whether Clark was sound in mind, while the more sympathetic explanation was that he is just the type who imagines himself as the super-secret service agent. It did his career no long-term damage, but Dudley Clark's strange episode of cross-dressing remains an enduring mystery. 
By the spring of 1943, following the successful North African campaign, the danger that Spain might join the Axis had receded, and after more than three years of playing cat and mouse with the Germans, Hilgarth was keen to counterattack. In February 1943, he sent a letter to the Director of Naval Intelligence, declaring, It is time to pass from the defensive to the offensive. It is time to get tough. Axis submarines were still using Spanish waters. Spanish fishing vessels were being used to spot U-boat targets. German and German-paid saboteurs were preying on British shipping, and the Spanish port authorities were supplying the Abwehr with more or less any naval intelligence they obtained. All of this was in direct violation of Spanish neutrality. Despite repeated British protests, Hilgarth pointed out, the Axis was allowed with little or no interference from the Spanish authorities and in spite of constant British representations to establish and maintain observation and reporting stations at vantage points along the Spanish coast. Hilgarth specifically cited the activities of Adolf Klaus's older brother Luis in Huelva. The solution Hilgarth proposed was simple and dramatic. I have found a good man prepared to stick a limpet bomb on one of the larger German ships from a fishing boat on a dark night with rain. The cost of the operation would be 50,000 pesetas, 5,000 before, and 45,000 on completion. The bomb would be timed to go off after the enemy ship left harbour. The Foreign Office should not be involved. All operations are, if I may say so, better left to me, wrote Hilgarth. If anything goes wrong, there is a perfectly good comeback by referring to German sabotage in Spain, and I could always be disowned and officially sacrificed. I am happy to stand the rub, as I feel so strongly that the situation now warrants action of this kind. All Hilgarth wanted was a nod of approval and a bomb. The request was turned down flat. If the Spaniards got wind that the British naval attaché was sticking limpet mines to boats, there would be a diplomatic explosion, possibly undoing all Hilgarth's good work to date. You and your staff have shown that you are quite able to take care of yourselves, but I am not prepared to take the chance of anything going wrong wrote Rushbrook, the new director of naval intelligence, adding that an attack on German shipping in Spanish waters was both undesirable and unnecessary. Hilgarth was deeply frustrated, itching to land a blow on his German adversaries, but held in check. The cavalry of St. George had disbanded. He was getting bored. At the very moment Hilgarth's sabotage plan was vetoed, Gomez Bear reappeared in Madrid, fresh from his briefing on Operation Mincemeat, and with new instructions for his boss. Once the body was delivered by HMS Seraph, it would be up to Hilgarth to coordinate its reception in Spain, to find out where and when it landed, and what had happened to the documents, and maintain the essential fiction that a crucial batch of secrets had gone missing. The novelist would now write the second chapter of Operation Mincemeat. He would take the role of hero. Gomez Bear would play second lead, Adolf Klaus in Huelva would, with luck, act as the helpful receptionist, and in Madrid, at the very centre of the web of German intelligence, was a man who might have been typecast as the leading villain. Chapter 12 The Spy Who Baked Cakes The Abwehr's agents and informants in Spain came not as single spies, but in battalions, and Spanish collaboration with the Germans, as one MI5 officer put it, was ubiquitous. Of the 391 people employed in the German embassy in Madrid, 220 were Abwehr officers, divided into sections for espionage, sabotage and counter-espionage, deploying some 1,500 agents throughout Spain, many of them German émigrés. These, in turn, recruited their own sub-agents in a vast and sprawling network, all classes were represented from cabinet ministers to unnamed stewards of cargo ships, according to a wartime intelligence assessment. In the higher ranks there was undoubtedly a genuine ideological sympathy, but at a lower level the transaction was mainly financial, and in a country where so many live at starvation level, recruiting was fairly easy. The quantity of intelligence pouring into the Abwehr's Madrid headquarters, which adjoined the embassy, was so enormous that it required 34 radio operators and 10 secretaries, including Adolf Klaus's cousin, Elsa, and maintained a direct teletype link with Berlin via Paris. Thanks to one of his agents, a senior officer in the Direction General de Seguridad, the Spanish security service, Alan Hilgarth knew the name, rank, role, and, in most cases, the codename of virtually every Abwehr agent of importance, 
At Hilgarth's behest, this agent had set up a special section to monitor German espionage. Ostensibly, this was to ensure that the Spanish Ministry of the Interior was kept informed of covert German activities. Indeed, the reports went to the Ministry of the Interior, wrote Hilgarth, but they also came to us. This same informer provided Hilgarth with a complete list of Abwehr personnel in Spain, with particulars on each. Menzies, the head of MI6, authorised Hilgarth to buy the list for a very large sum. Back in London, Philby carped that the price paid by Armada to this precious source was very high indeed. I had to fight to get an extra five pounds a month for agents who produced regular, if less spectacular, intelligence, he complained. But it was worth every peseta, providing British intelligence with a detailed picture of the Abwehr power structure in Spain. Know thine enemy, and then work out how to deceive him. At the head of the Abwehr station in Spain stood Wilhelm Leisner, honorary attaché at the German embassy, who used the code names Heidelberg and Juan. A small, soft-voiced figure and Condor Legion veteran, Leisner had stayed on in Spain, where he ran an import-export firm under the pseudonym Gustav Lenz. Beneath Leisner were Hans Gouda, in charge of naval intelligence, Fritz Knapparate, an agent runner codenamed Federico, and Georgi Helmut Lang, known as Emilio. Since the autumn of 1942, the Abwehr's ranks in Spain had also included Major Fritz Baumann, a former policeman seconded by the German army to the sabotage branch of the Abwehr. Baumann was in charge of coordinating attacks on Allied shipping, but he was also an experienced pathologist who had studied forensic medicine at Hamburg Police Academy before the war. An expert in determining the cause of death and the extent of injuries, Baumann had examined hundreds of corpses, both before and during the war. But the Abwehr officer who most intrigued Hilgarth was Major Karl Erich Kulenthal. The MI5 file on this man is three inches thick, and more was known about him than about any other German spy in Spain. Kulenthal's father had been a distinguished soldier, rising to the rank of general and serving as Germany's military attaché in Paris and Madrid. The Kulenthal family was wealthy and well-connected. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, the Abwehr chief, was a relative, which helped to explain Kulenthal's rapid rise through the ranks of the intelligence service. Like Klaus, Kulenthal had served in the Condor Legion, a secretary to Joachim Rohleder, the unit's chief of intelligence. After the Civil War, he returned to Germany for a while, working for an uncle in the wine trade, and then for his father-in-law in the Dean's clothing firm. He travelled to London, Paris, and Barcelona. He spoke good English and perfect Spanish. By 1938 he was back in Spain, ostensibly running a radio business while continuing his undercover work. At the outbreak of war, he was appointed Adjutant General to Leisner, but he soon distinguished himself by his raw ambition and drive. In 1943, at the age of 37, Kulenthal was head of the Abwehr's espionage section in Madrid, coordinating political and military intelligence, and operating under the codename Carlos, or, more usually, Felipe. In the bars and cafés of Madrid, he was known as Don Pablo. Kulenthal's spy network extended to every corner of the country, but his specialty was recruiting agents in neutral Spain to work overseas, in North Africa, Portugal, Gibraltar, and, most important, Britain and America. In Britain alone, the Felipe network included dozens of undercover agents, sending back huge volumes of top-grade information. Nothing happened in the Abwehr station without him knowing about it, said a fellow officer. Kulenthal cut a dandyish figure in the streets of Madrid. Tall and aristocratic, he wore his hair swept back and had fleshy, boneless cheeks, a curved, hawk-like nose, and blue, piercing eyes. He wore elegant, double-breasted suits and drove a dark-brown French four-seater coupé, using different number plates. His fingernails were always carefully manicured. He played tennis beautifully. MI5 assessed him as a very efficient, ambitious, and dangerous man with an enormous capacity for work. He was promoted, was awarded the War Service Cross, and gradually contrived to push Leisner out of all positions of authority, until the nominal head of the Abwehr became a mere figurehead. By 1943, Kulenthal was in charge. He was an extremely able man, and carried in his head all that went on in the office, and became so essential that he became virtually the head of the office. 
Inevitably, his Abwehr colleagues were envious of the esteem and reputation which Kurenthal seems to enjoy with the high chiefs. As the protégé of Canaris, he could do no wrong. A confidential file from 1943 described him as by far the best man in Group 1 espionage in Spain, and very reliable from the political point of view. Himmler himself sent a personal message of appreciation to Felipe in Madrid for the work achieved by his network in England. In the eyes of the German high command, Kulenthal was the golden boy of the Madrid Abwehr. The reality was rather different. So far from being a master spy, Kulenthal was a one-man espionage disaster area who had already fallen victim to one of the most elaborate hoaxes ever mounted. Instead of winning the spy war, Kulenthal was helping Germany to lose it in the most dramatic fashion. In May 1941, a Spaniard named Juan Puyol Garcia presented himself to the Abwehr in Madrid and explained that he intended to travel to Britain and wished to spy for the Germans when he got there. Kulenthal was initially unenthusiastic, telling Puyol he was extremely busy and that his visit was inconvenient. Puyol was bald, bearded, short-sighted and distinctly odd, but the Spaniard seemed to nurse a genuine hatred of the British and a profound admiration for Hitler. He told Kulenthal he had good contacts within the Spanish Security Service and Foreign Office. Eventually, Kulenthal agreed to take him on. Puyol was instructed on writing in secret ink and told to forward information through the Spanish military attaché in London. The Spaniard was sent off with a wad of English money, a number of cover addresses in Britain, and some advice from Kulenthal, who told his new recruit to be careful not to underestimate the British as they were a formidable enemy. Puyol could expect to stay in Britain indefinitely, since this, Kulenthal predicted, would be a very long war. On July 19th, Kulenthal received a letter from Puyol, written in the secret ink, informing him that he had arrived safely in England and had recruited a courier working for a civilian airline, who had agreed to carry his letters at one pound per delivery and post them in Lisbon, thus circumventing the British censor. In fact, Puyol had not reached Britain and was still in Portugal, this was the first of a long and fantastic stream of lies he would feed to Kulenthal. Puyol was no Nazi sympathizer. Born in 1912 to a liberal middle-class Catalan family, he had somehow contrived to fight for both sides in the Spanish Civil War, though he never fired a gun, deserted, and emerged with a ferocious hatred of fascism. By 1941, he had resolved to fight the war in his own way. Three times he approached the British authorities in Madrid, offering to spy for Britain. Repeatedly rejected, he had offered himself instead to the Abwehr, intent on betraying them. From Lisbon, Puyol began sending fictitious reports to the Germans, pretending to be in Britain. His information was culled from guidebooks and magazines borrowed at the public library, an old map of Britain, newsreels, a Portuguese publication entitled The British Fleet, and a vocabulary of English military terms. Puyol had never set foot in Britain, and it showed. His reports were full of elementary mistakes. He could never get his head around the pre-decimal currency. He confidently asserted, There are people in Glasgow who will do anything for a litre of wine, whereas most Glaswegians at the time would never have consented to drink wine, even if it had been served in litres. Kulenthal, however, believed every word. Meanwhile, Puyol's messages were being deciphered by Britain's codebreakers, to the consternation of MI5. Who was this German agent, operating undetected in Britain, who seemed to know nothing about the place? Finally, early in 1942, after Puyol's wife approached the U.S. legation in Lisbon, the self-made spy was identified, and Allied intelligence realized, belatedly, that it had an espionage gem in its hands. Puyol was whisked to Britain, installed in a safe house in North London, and put to work as a double agent. His first codename, Bovril, was soon changed to the more respectful Garbo, in recognition of his astonishing acting talents. Over the next three years, Agent Garbo sent 1,399 messages and 423 letters to his handlers in Spain. Three full-time MI5 case officers were needed to handle his traffic, and the 27 fictional characters in the Garbo network. Garbo's sub-agents were British, Greek, American, South African, Portuguese, Venezuelan and Spanish. Some were officials, such as his mole in the Spanish Ministry of Information, some were disgruntled soldiers or pilots, and at least five were seamen recruited from different ports around the UK. Other recruits included a commercial traveller, 
housewives, waiters, office workers, a wireless mechanic, and an Indian poet named Rags, who was part of a strange Aryan organization operating in Wales. Garbo's agents had nothing in common, except for the fact that they did not exist. The information they sent to Madrid was a careful concoction of non-dangerous truths, half-truths, and untruths, and Kulental happily passed it all on to Berlin, never once suspecting that he was being duped. We have absolute trust in you, he told his star spy, massaging the ego of the agent whose success was ensuring his own rapid promotion. Your last efforts are all magnificent. Puyol's messages to his Nazi handler were flights of pompous poetry. He never used one word where eight very long ones would do, and he showered Kulental with a combination of flattery and Nazi bombast. My dear friend and comrade, Puyol wrote in a typical effusion, we are two friends who share the same ideals and are fighting for the same ends. I have always had a very strong feeling of respect and admiration for your advice, full of good sense and calm. I must be frank and open up my heart to you. These things can only be dealt with between men of spirit and tenacity, and by people who follow a doctrine, by fighting men and bold combatants. The unfolding of confidences can only be made between comrades. Thus the great Germany has become what it is. Thus it has been able to deposit such great confidence in the man who governs it, knowing that he is not a democratic despot, but a man of low birth who has only followed an ideal. I feel more than ever a sensation of hatred, more than death for our enemy, and an ever-increasing irresistible urge to destroy his entire existence. For page after page, Garbo railed against the democratic Jewish Masonic ideology, urged the Germans to attack Britain. England must be taken by arms. She must be fallen upon, destroyed, dominated, and peppered his letters with Nazi jingoism. With a raised arm, I end this letter with a pious remembrance for all our dead. Kulenthal swallowed the lot. His characteristic German lack of sense of humour in such serious circumstances as these blinded him to the absurdities of the story we were unfolding, wrote Garbo's MI5 handler. The Abwehr officer openly boasted of his talented spy, codenamed Arabel, who was sending top-secret information from the heart of Britain. When Canaris, the Abwehr chief, visited Spain, Kulenthal was the star turn, and amused his boss with one story in particular. In March 1943... Agent Arabel had obtained a valuable handbook on RAF planes, which he had wrapped inside greaseproof paper and baked into a cake. On the top, in chocolate icing, he had inscribed, With good wishes to Odette. Enclosed with the cake was a letter to make it seem that the gift came from a British seaman to a girlfriend in Lisbon. Kulenthal explained to Canaris that the cake had been dropped off at a safe house in Lisbon, along with a covering note from Puyol, which he read to his delighted audience. I did the lettering myself. I had to use several rationed products, which I have given in a good cause. Good appetite. Kulenthal ended his performance with a lumbering joke, pointing out that, although his agent made cakes which were unpleasant in taste, their contents were excellent. Canaris was impressed. Kulenthal's reputation went up another notch. The cake, in fact, had been baked by Garbo's wife, sent to Lisbon by diplomatic bag, and dropped off by an MI6 agent. The RAF pamphlet was out of date, and British intelligence knew the Abwehr had it already. By 1943, Karl Erich Kulenthal, the star of the Madrid Abwehr, was eating out of Garbo's hand and voracious for more. A separate office was set up to handle the vast information coming in, and running the Felipe network had become Kulenthal's principal job, as a keen and efficient officer, he did everything in his power to supply Garbo with ciphers, secret inks, and addresses of the highest grade to ensure his greater security. He was also forthcoming with considerable funds. Through radio interceptions, the British watched with pleasure as Kulenthal grew steadily more dependent on Garbo, and his stock rose in Berlin. We had the satisfaction of knowing through MSS, most secret sources, or ULTRA, that all Garbo material was being given priority, and that every military report which reached Madrid from the Garbo network was immediately retransmitted to Berlin. Garbo's British handlers were amazed at how readily Kulenthal believed the many incredible things we asked them to believe. Indeed, the more sensational the reports, the more certain could we be of Madrid retransmitting them to headquarters. 
Sometimes Kulantal seemed to pass on Garbo's information without even reading it, let alone questioning it. In some cases, where messages appeared to be of extreme urgency, they were retransmitted to Berlin with approximately one hour's delay in Madrid. Through Garbo and Kulantal, British intelligence was speaking directly to Berlin. Felipe had become our mouthpiece. Here then was an invaluable channel through which we would be able to deceive the enemy. As they combed through Kulantal's messages to Berlin, the British code breakers noticed something rather odd. Garbo's intelligence was already sensational enough, but Kulantal was spicing it up still further to lend extra weight. He was not above inventing his own sub-agents and adding them to the pot. Many of his elaborations were either wrong or meaningless. He also made some hilarious mistakes, including his conviction that the Isle of Man is in the north of Ireland. The added extras, MI5 concluded, were invented by Felipe himself. Kulantal was deceiving his Abwehr bosses by passing on invented intelligence, along with the information he fervently believed to be true. The information provided by his organization up to date has been either untrue, useless, or provided by MI5 through the double agents under its control. Guy Liddell of MI5 considered Kulantal to be one of the people who make up most of their information. He may also have been embezzling. Some within the Abwehr certainly thought so. According to one intercepted message, Kulantal was said to be running a very expensive agent in London, a Yugoslav diplomat, who had cost the Abwehr £400 over two years. There are officers in Spain who are convinced that K is making half-part business, i.e. splitting the monthly allowances between his and the diplomat's pocket. There was one other factor that made Garbo's German spymaster ideally suited to receive the mincemeat hoax. Karl Erich Kulenthal was Jewish. The Abwehr officer had a Jewish grandmother. Kulenthal did not consider himself Jewish. Marriage to a half-Jewish woman had not impeded his father's military career, but that was before the rise of the Nazis. Under Hitler's brutal racial policies, the one quarter of Jewish blood in Kulenthal was enough to mark him out for discrimination, persecution, or worse. Kulenthal would later claim that anti-Semitism had forced him to flee Germany, leaving a good job as manager of a large champagne and wine cellar owned by his uncle. His brother, an army officer, had left Germany for the same reason, winding up in Chile. It was Canaris who had intervened on behalf of his relative. The Abwehr chief had a record of helping Jews, and arranged for him to take up the post in Spain, since he could not serve in the army being half-blood Jew. In Madrid, he was farther from Gestapo persecution, though hardly safe. In 1941, Canaris had his protégé Aryanized, and formally declared to be of good German stock. Leisner, the chief of the Abwehr station, confirmed that Kulenthal was now officially racially pure. In the minds of hardline Nazis, however, either a person had Jewish blood, and was thereby corrupt and dangerous, or he did not. The attempt to tinker with Hitler's race laws provoked a rebuke from Berlin— he has been created an Aryan at the instigation of his station. A formulation of this nature is out of touch of all reality. Can Juan, Leisner, state the legal foundation for such acts of state? The Spanish branch of the SD, the SS Intelligence Organization, also questioned how Kulental could simply be declared Aryan, since there appeared to be no authority for such an act. Canaris again intervened and the SD in Madrid was instructed to let the matter drop. Kulantal's colleagues in Spain knew of his Jewish ancestry and the attempt to expunge it. For some, this was prima facie evidence of treachery. Major Helm, the head of counterespionage in Spain, sent a confidential report to Canaris, accusing Kulantal of being in the pay of the British Secret Service. The Abwehr chief refused to take the report seriously. Helm was transferred to another Abwehr station. The British spies tracking Kulenthal had noted that he seemed cold and reserved, but also deeply uneasy. Appearance, nervous, uncertain. Peculiarity, shifty eyes, read one surveillance report. Kulenthal had every reason to be anxious. His stock in Berlin was high, thanks to Puyol and the Felipe network, but if Canaris should fall from power or cease to defend him, or if something went wrong with his organization, his anti-Semitic enemies would pounce. Kulenthal was deeply and understandably paranoid. 
failure might well prove fatal. As one informer told British intelligence, Kulenthal is trembling to keep his position so as not to have to return to Germany, and he is doing his utmost to please his superiors. Kulenthal had already fallen for the elaborate con that was Agent Garbo. He was the ideal target for Operation Mincemeat, deeply gullible but admired and trusted by his bosses, including Himmler and Canaris. Ambitious and determined, but also frantically eager to please, ready to pass on anything that might consolidate his reputation and save him from the fate suffered by others of Jewish blood. He was also vain, possibly corrupt, and prepared to deceive those of higher rank to enhance his own standing. Kulenthal perfectly exemplified the qualities that John Godfrey had identified as the two most dangerous flaws in a spy, wishfulness and yesmanship. He would believe anything he was fed, and he would do whatever he could to suck up to the boss and preserve his own skin. To succeed, Operation Mincemeat needed to reach Hitler himself. The best way of doing that, Alan Hilgarth knew, was to get the information to Adolf Klaus in Huelva, from whom it was certain to pass into the hands of Karl Erich Kulenthal, and then, with the blessing of that favoured but gullible officer, up the German chain of command. Klaus was the perfect recipient, because he was such an efficient spy. Kulenthal was the ideal spy to pass the information on, because he was worse than useless. Chapter 13 Mincemeat Sets Sail Leverton and Sons, undertakers and funeral directors, began making coffins in the St. Pancras area of London around the time of the French Revolution. For two hundred years, the business was passed from father to son, along with the severe and formal cast of countenance required of officials in the death business. By 1943, the custodian of this long tradition, six generations on, was Ivor Leverton. His older brother Derek was serving as a major with the Royal Artillery in North Africa, and about to take part in the invasion of Europe that everyone knew was coming. Ivor had breathing difficulties, and had been declared medically unfit for military service. He had therefore been left to run the family firm. Although only twenty-nine, Ivor took the traditions of the firm very seriously, ensuring that all clients, rich or poor, were treated with the same solemnity and dignity. But beneath that decorous exterior, like most undertakers, Ivor Leverton was a man of unflappable temperament and a bone-dry sense of humour. He felt a lingering guilt over being unable to fight on the front line. The closest he had come to seeing action was in 1941, when he went to collect a dead body from the Temperance Hospital, and a German bomb came down the chimney, blasting shards of glass through his black Anthony Eden hat. Ivor longed to play his part. He was only too pleased, therefore, to be asked to transport a body, in the middle of the night, in deadly secrecy, as a task of national importance. The request came from Police Constable Glyndon May, an officer working for Bentley Purchase, the St. Pancras coroner. Leverton and Sons did regular business with the coroner, but had never been presented with a job quite like this. I was not to divulge what I was told under the Official Secrets Act, not even to my own family, Ivor wrote in his diary. No record would be made, and we would not be paid a penny. May's request arrived on April Fool's Day, and for a moment Ivor Leverton wondered whether the phone call from St. Pancras Coroner's Court might be dismissed as a hoax. Constable May was entirely serious. Ivor should get a coffin and take it to the mortuary behind the coroner's office, where May would meet him at 1 a.m. on Saturday, April 17th. He should act entirely alone and carry the coffin himself. I was still in fairly good shape, grumbled Ivor, but this was really asking a bit much. Soon after midnight, Ivor Leverton tiptoed downstairs from the flat above the funeral parlour in Eversholt Street, taking care not to wake his wife, and retrieved a hearse from the company garage in Crawley Mews. He then drove to the front of the parlour and manhandled one of the firm's wooden, zinc-lined removal coffins into the back, hoping Pat, the firm's most inquisitive neighbour, would not wake up and spot him wrestling with a heavy coffin in the dark. Glyn May was waiting at the coroner's court. Together, with some difficulty, they heaved the body into the coffin. The dead man was wearing a khaki military uniform, but no shoes. Leverton was struck by his height. Leverton and son standard coffins measured six feet two inches inside, but the dead man must have stood six foot four inches tall, and could not be made to lie flat. By adjustment to the knees and setting the very large feet at an angle, Ivor wrote, 
we were just able to manage. After an uneventful drive through the deserted city streets to Hackney Mortuary, Leverton helped May unload the coffin, left a passenger in one of the mortuary refrigerators, and returned home. His wife, pregnant with one of the next generation of Leverton undertakers, was still asleep. Hackney had been selected by Bentley Purchase because it was run by a mortuary keeper on whom he could rely not to talk. Later that day, at six in the evening, Bentley Purchase met Chumley and Montague at the mortuary with Glyn May, the coroner's officer. The body of Glyndower Michael was removed from the refrigerator and placed on a mortuary gurney. Nearly three months had now elapsed since Michael's death, and during the long period of refrigeration his eyes had sunk into their sockets, and the skin was yellowed from poison-induced jaundice. Otherwise the body appeared to be in a reasonable state of preservation. The life jacket was put over his head and tied around his waist. The yellow military jackets were known as May Wests, from rhyming slang for breasts. When fully inflated, the rubber jacket gave the wearer a distinctly busty look, reminiscent, if you happen to be a sex-starved soldier, of the curvaceous film star. The chain was looped around his shoulder, outside the coat and under the May West, and securely tied to the belt of the trench coat. It had been assumed that the attaché case would be given to Jewel to clip to the chain at the last moment, but it was found that the canister could accommodate both case and body. The handle of the case was fastened to the end of the chain and placed on the body. Jewel would now only have to insert the documents and tip the body into the water, thus ensuring that it would arrive on shore in a way that made it as easy as possible for the Spaniards or the Germans to remove the bag and chain without trace. The watch, with the winder run down, was set to 2.59 and fastened to the left wrist. With luck, the Germans would assume that the watch had stopped when the imagined Catalina had crashed into the sea. All Major Martin now needed to complete his outfit was footwear but getting him into his boots proved to be the most difficult aspect of the entire dressing operation. In the extra-cold refrigerator, the feet had frozen solid at right angles to the legs. Even when the laces were fully undone, the boots refused to go on, for it is impossible to put on any boot, let alone a stiff army boot, without bending the ankle. Bentley Purchase came up with a solution. "'I've got it,' said the coroner. "'We'll get an electric fire and thaw out the feet only.' As soon as the boots are on, we'll pop him back in the refrigerator again and refreeze him. P.C. May went to fetch the single-bar electric heater from the lodge of the coroner's office. There then followed a truly macabre scene, as Montague attempted to defrost the dead man's feet, and Chumley tried to lever on the boots. Finally, the ankles defrosted sufficiently, and the boots went on, followed by gaiters. Thawing and refreezing was certain to hasten decomposition, but with the gaiter securely buckled, the feet would probably not fall off. It was, said Montague, with feeling, the least pleasant part of our work. Major Martin's wallet, containing the letters from Pam and Father, was slipped into his inside breast pocket. His remaining pockets were filled with all the litter that made up a complete personality. Pencil, loose change, keys, and, in an inspired last-minute edition, two ticket stubs for Strike a New Note, a variety show at the Prince of Wales Theatre, starring the music-hall comedian Sid Field. This was another of Chumley's inspirations. HMS Seraph would depart from Holy Lock on Monday, April 19th, and take ten or eleven days to reach Huelva. The Germans, however, needed to be persuaded that the body had washed up after no more than a week at sea, following an air crash. If the body was found on, say, April 28th, then there must be something in Martin's pockets indicating that he was still in London on April 24th. This was where Sid Field could play his part. Chumley purchased four tickets for his new show at the Prince of Wales Theatre on April 22nd, tore off the dated counterfoils of the two in the middle, and put them in the pocket of Major Martin's trench coat. We decided Bill Martin and Pam should have a farewell party before he left. This would be their last evening together before the young officer headed to North Africa and certain death. The Stubbs would offer incontrovertible proof that the only way he could have reached Spain by the 28th was by aircraft. From a close examination of the letters and pocket litter, the Germans would reconstruct Major Martin's last poignant days. April 18th. Check in to the Naval and Military Club. April 19th. Receive bill from S.J. Phillips of New Bond Street for Diamond Ring. April 21st, 
Lunch with Father and Gwatkin, the solicitor, at the Carlton Grill. Pam goes to dance with Jock and Hazel. April 22nd, go to the theatre with Pam, followed by a nightclub. April 24th, check out of Naval and Military Club, paying bill in cash, one pound and ten shillings, collect letters from Combined Operations HQ and War Office, board flight to Gibraltar at 2.59pm, crash in the Gulf of Cadiz and die. The body was photographed twice on the mortuary gurney. Only the torso of the man holding the trolley is visible, but this was almost certainly P.C. May, the coroner's officer. The mouth of the corpse has fallen open, the skin around the nose has sunk, and the upper part of the face appears discoloured. The fingers of the left hand are bent as if clawing in pain. These are the only known pictures of Glyndar Michael, a man whom no one bothered to photograph when he was alive. The already visible decomposition of the face raised another potential complication. The body would now have to be driven 400 miles to Scotland, then loaded into a cramped submarine and taken on a ten-day sea voyage that might encounter rough weather. If the canister was jolted about, the face would surely suffer further damage from chafing against the sides of the canister. Again, Bentley Purchase came up with a solution. Get an army blanket, wrap the face and neck in it, and there will be no friction. The body was rolled up in a blanket and lightly tied with tape. Following Bernard Spilsbury's instructions, 21 pounds of dry ice had already been placed in the canister to expel the oxygen. The corpse was now reverently inserted into the homemade carrying case and packed around with more dry ice before the lid was screwed tightly in place. Major Martin now needed to get to Scotland, fast. Waiting in the Hackney Mortuary parking lot was a Fordson BBE van, with two seats in front, fitted with a customised V8 engine. At the wheel was a small man with a neat moustache, wearing civilian clothes. His name was St. John Jock Horsfall, an MI5 chauffeur who also happened to be one of the most famous racing drivers in the country. St. John Ratcliffe Stuart Horsfall was born in 1910 into a Norfolk family of car fanatics. He acquired his first Aston Martin at the age of 23. Between 1933 and the outbreak of war, he won trophy after trophy on the racing circuit. In 1938, Jock Horsfall took on six BMWs at Donington Park in the black car, his two-litre speed model Aston Martin, and beat them all. He seldom wore racing leathers or a crash helmet, preferring to race in a shirt and tie with either a bomber jacket or a sleeveless sweater. Horsfall was short-sighted and astigmatic, but declined to wear spectacles. He drove at staggering speed and suffered a number of serious accidents, including one in a trial run at Brooklands, when his car, according to one eyewitness, went berserk and tried to hurl itself over the top of the banking. On another occasion, the throttle stuck open, forcing the engine up to 10,000 RPM until the clutch exploded, sending potentially lethal pieces of metal bursting through the bell housing at his feet. At the start of the war, Horsfall had been recruited into the security service by Eric Holt Wilson, the deputy director of MI5, who had employed the racing driver's mother as a staff car driver during the First World War. Horsfall's primary job was driving MI5 and MI6 officers and agents, double agents and captured enemy spies, from one place to another very fast. He was also involved in testing the security of naval sites and airfields, and was privy to a good deal of highly classified information. Horsfall knew only that he was to transport to the west of Scotland a canister containing a dead body, which would be used to play a humiliating trick on the Germans. Horsfall was fond of practical jokes. He once wired up a toilet seat to a battery and waited for a girlfriend to use it. The scream that Kath gave when the magneto was turned on was most satisfying, he recalled. He even wrote a poem to commemorate the occasion. I gave her time to start her piddle, then gave the thing a violent twiddle, before I could complete a turn, she closed the circuit with her stern, and shooting off the wooden seat, emitted a most piercing shriek. The idea of carrying a dead body through the night in order to bamboozle the Germans appealed strongly to Jock Horsfall's sense of humour, yet he never told anyone of this, perhaps the most significant drive of his life. Reckless behind the wheel, outside a motorised vehicle, Jock Horsfall was discretion personified. MI5 had a fleet of cars and vans, but for this operation Horsfall had selected one of his own, a six-year-old, thirty-hundred-weight Fordson van, 
customized to accommodate an Aston Martin in the back, with a souped-up engine in which he claimed to have done a hundred miles an hour in the mall. This was the van he used to transport the black car to the racetrack. It was past midnight when Montague, Chumley and Horsfall loaded the canister into the back. The trio paused for a brief pit stop at Chumley's news flat off Cromwell Road, where they ate a light meal, with one of us sitting in the window to make sure that no one stole Major Martin from the van. Even if he was not worth much to the thief, he was valuable to us. It was, Chumley later said, the first time he had ever had supper with a corpse parked in his garage. Chumley's sister, Dotty, prepared some cheese sandwiches and a thermos of hot tea, and at around two in the morning the party set off, heading north. Jewel had requested that the additional passenger be brought aboard HMS Seraph no later than midday on April 18th. Horsfall was racing against the clock, his second favourite occupation. Operation Mincemeat almost came to a premature and embarrassing end. On passing a local cinema where a spy film was showing, Jock Horsfall remarked on the much better story they were currently engaged in, became paralysed with giggles, and nearly drove into a tram stop. A little later... The racing driver failed to see a roundabout until too late, and shot over the grass circle in the middle. This is what driving with Jock Horsfall was like, an experience rendered yet more alarming by the need to drive with masked headlights during the blackout. Luckily, there were few other cars about. Montague and Chumley took turns lying in the back and trying to sleep, as if that were possible when being driven at high speed by a myopic Grand Prix driver with no headlights. This was the closest either came to death in action during the war. It was still pitch dark as they hurtled across the border into Scotland. South of the village of Langbank, on the road between Glasgow and Greenock, along the west side of the River Clyde, they stopped to stretch and eat dotty sandwiches. In the pallid dawn light of the highlands, they posed for photographs beside the van. Jock Horsfall climbed into the back and was photographed drinking a cup of tea perched on the canister with the corpse inside. At Greenock Dock, on the west coast of Scotland, a launch waited to meet them. With the help of half a dozen seamen and some rope, the four-hundred-pound canister was carefully lowered into the boat, followed by the dinghy and the oars. It took only a few minutes to motor to HMS Forth, the depot ship with the submarine lying alongside. The officers of the ship were partially in the know, and the arrival of the canister provoked no suspicion or comment among the crew, being accepted as merely being a more than usually urgent and breakable FOS shipment. Montague and Chumley were greeted warmly by Jewel, who gave orders for the special shipment to be lowered onto the submarine the following morning, along with a large supply of gin, sherry and whiskey he was transporting to refresh the 8th flotilla in Algiers, this cargo was also kept secret from the crew. Jewel now received his final instructions from Montague and Chumley, and a large buff envelope containing the documents, which would be securely stashed in the submarine safe until the body was ready to be launched. In the ship's log, the operation would be referred to as 191435B, the code number of Jewel's secret operational orders. At the last moment, Montague decided to keep one of the dinghy oars as a souvenir. If the forty-four-man crew of the Seraph thought it strange to be taking on a dinghy with only one oar, no one said so. After three months in the imaginary company of Bill Martin, Montague and Chumley headed for home. There was something oddly touching in the leave-taking. By this time Major Martin had to become a completely living person to us, wrote Montague, who would never have come across a man like Glyndower Michael in his normal life. The fictional creation had taken on a form of reality— we had come to feel that we had known Bill Martin from his early childhood, and were taking a genuine and personal interest in the progress of his courtship and financial troubles. Montague wrote in excitement to Iris, relaying his news such as can be written. I had to go up to Scotland last weekend. It was great fun, as I and another couple had to drive up in a lorry. It was a lovely moonlit night, so it wasn't too bad even with wartime headlights— and it was quite like old times to go for a long drive. I had two days on board a ship, stationary, I haven't been to sea yet. It was great fun, as they were a grand lot on board. When I got back, things were very hectic, as I had to button up the job I had been on. On board the Seraph, First Lieutenant David Scott, second in command, was instructed by Jewel to take extra care when bringing aboard the canister-marked optical instruments— 
I was to see that this package was treated with every precaution to ensure that it was not bumped while being embarked through the torpedo loading hatch, he wrote. One torpedo was left behind to make room for the canister in the reload rack. Like most wartime submarines, the Seraph did not have enough bunks to accommodate all the crew, so they took turns sleeping in the forward torpedo room. For the next ten days, they would be sleeping alongside Bill Martin. At sixteen hundred hours on April 19th, HMS Seraph slipped her moorings and sailed out of Holy Lock into the Clyde. Montague sent word to the Admiralty that Operation Mincemeat was underway. It was a real thrill, he reflected, yet the excitement was tinged with real anxiety. Would it work? The Seraph ploughed toward the sea in the gloaming. Spring was on the way, wrote Scott, but there was little sign of it in the wooded slopes of the hills on our port side. To starboard lay Danoon, its outline softened by a light mist, and the smoke from wood and coal fires rising from the chimneys of its dark grey houses. Out in the broad Clyde, the Seraph linked up with her escort, a minesweeper, whose principal task was to ward off possible attacks from British aircraft, which tended to assume submarines were hostile, unless there was clear evidence otherwise. Abreast of the Isle of Arran in the Inner Hebrides, the Seraph performed a trim dive to ensure that the submarine was correctly balanced, and then headed into the Irish Sea. South of the Scilly Isles, the minesweeper departed, having taken aboard a canvas bag of the crew's last letters. A final exchange of good luck signals passed by light, and we headed out into the Atlantic swell, diving shortly afterwards. The Seraph was alone. The weather was fine, and with only a light sea running, the ship settled into the strange, half-lit world of a long submarine journey, compounded of equal parts boredom, anticipation, and fear. By day, the submarine would travel submerged. At night, she would resurface and continue by diesel to recharge her batteries, and then dive again as dawn broke. If they were not attacked or otherwise diverted, covering 130 miles a day, the passage to Welva should take ten days. It was stuffy below decks. The crew and officers were on watch for two hours and then off for four, twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. Monotony never really set in, wrote Scott, because at the back of our minds was the determination to survive, which demanded constant alertness. By wartime standards, the food on the Seraph was excellent and plentiful. We were never short of meat, butter, sugar or eggs. We even had luxuries like chocolate biscuits and honey. We were lucky enough to have a chef who could bake good bread. No one shaved, and everyone slept in their clothes. A few days out of Holy Lock, and the smell of unwashed bodies and engine oil suffused the ship. Submarine crews develop a sixth sense for the peculiar. Long periods spent under water, in close proximity, with little to do, when the faintest noise or smallest mistake can mean death, render submariners acutely sensitive to anything out of the ordinary. Jewel firmly believed he was the only person aboard with an inkling of the additional passenger, but at least some members of the crew suspected that the strange tubular canister in the forward torpedo room did not contain optical or meteorological instruments. It was a telltale length and oddly heavy. When the submarine lurched, a faint sloshing noise could be heard inside. Crewmen began joking about John Brown's body mouldering in the torpedo rack, and our pal Charlie, the weatherman coming for a ride. Jewel himself had no idea of the identity of the body, real or fictional. In his mind, he too had begun to refer to his passenger as Charlie. Lieutenant Scott lay on his bunk, attempting to read War and Peace, and trying not to think about death. He admired Jewel, considering him the epitome of what a submarine captain should be. Quite fearless, he was invariably cool and calculating. Yet, however brave and astute his commanding officer, Scott knew that he was quite likely to die before his twenty-third birthday. At that time, the chances of returning home from a Mediterranean-based submarine were fifty-fifty. Before joining the Seraph, Scott had spent a week in London. On the last day of his leave, his uncle Jack and recently widowed mother took him to lunch in an expensive restaurant. When the time came to say goodbye, both mother and uncle had tears in their eyes. I realised with a bit of a shock, he recalled, that they were thinking they might not see me again. A few feet away, in his own bunk, the commander of the Seraph, Lieutenant Bill Jewell, was not thinking about death. 
Indeed, in more than three years of the most ferocious submarine combat and several irregular and exceptionally dangerous missions, the thought of dying seems never to have crossed his mind. Jules had been born in the Seychelles, where his father, a doctor, was in the colonial service. He volunteered for submarine work in 1936. The war was already two years old when the young lieutenant qualified for command of the newly launched Seraph, an S-class submarine. Shortly after taking command, Jules fell down the hatch. In 1946, a doctor pointed out that Jules had broken two vertebrae. He fought the entire war with a broken neck. His first patrol, in July 1942, had set the pattern for what followed. Extreme danger, a narrow escape, and a certain amount of farce. The Seraph was fired on by an RAF plane, but escaped serious damage. Then, in the waters off Norway, Jules spotted a U-boat and blew it to pieces with a single torpedo. The Seraph's first kill turned out to be a whale. In October 1942, during the run-up to Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, Bill Jewell was given his first secret mission, transporting the American General Mark Clark, Eisenhower's deputy, to the Algerian coast for secret negotiations with the French commanders there. The invasion, led by General Patton, was already underway, and the neutrality of the Vichy forces in French Algeria was considered critical if it was to succeed. Many Vichy officers were deeply hostile to the British, following the sinking of much of the French fleet at Mer al-Kabir. Clark faced an extremely delicate situation. Jules had the equally tricky task of getting him ashore without being spotted. On October 19th, the Seraph and her American passengers arrived at the designated spot, a remote coastal villa some fifty miles west of Algiers. Soon after midnight, Jewell brought the submarine to within 500 yards of the shore, and the American negotiating party disembarked in four collapsible canoes, accompanied by a protection squad of three British marines of the Special Boat Service, led by Roger Jumbo Courtney, a former big game hunter with a bashed-in sort of face and a blunt, no-nonsense manner. The all-night negotiations went well, but at one point the visitors were forced to hide in a dusty cellar to avoid an impromptu visit from the gendarmes. Courtney suffered a coughing fit, which threatened to give them away. General Clark passed the choking commando some chewing gum. "'Your American gum has so little taste,' whispered Courtney, once the spasm subsided. "'Yes,' said Clark. "'I've already used it.' When the time came to pick up the party, Jewel brought the seraph perilously close to shore, until she was almost aground. Clark appears to have been betrayed, and moments ahead of a French raiding party, the general and his party dashed for the boats, paddled through the surf, and scrambled aboard the Seraph. Jewel gave the order to turn tail and then dive. Sir Andrew Cunningham, the addressee of one of the mincemeat letters and Royal Navy Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean, described the joint Anglo-American adventure as a happy augury for the future. Jewel's unflappability had marked him out for secret work, and his next assignment was even stranger, to pick up, from the south coast of France, General Henri Honoré Giraud, a charismatic, self-important, and popular veteran of the Great War. The 63-year-old French general was seen as the only officer able to deliver French North African forces to the Allies. Giraud was hiding out with the French resistance, after having escaped from the Germans. Allied command decided that Giraud could be an important figurehead to galvanize Vichy opposition to the Germans, if he could be safely collected. The mission was codenamed Operation Kingpin. The only problem was that the crusty general, like de Gaulle, was said to entertain a hearty loathing for the British, and had insisted that, if he were to be rescued, this must be done by Americans. The Seraph, therefore, would briefly have to adopt a new nationality. An American captain, Gerald Wright, was placed in nominal command. Flying the Stars and Stripes, Seraph duly waited off the coast at Le Lavandou, until Jules spotted the light signals from the shore and sent a boat to pick up Giraud. The French general managed to miss his footing while transferring to the submarine, and was hauled aboard dripping wet. To maintain the charade, the crew of the Seraph attempted to adopt American accents, and spent the rest of the voyage imitating Clark Gable and Jimmy Stewart, General Giraud, it turned out, spoke English, and was not remotely fooled. He was far too proud, however, to acknowledge the trick. In the wake of the North African invasion, the Seraph roamed the Mediterranean, 
conducting more traditional submarine operations and attacking any and every enemy vessel. In the space of a few weeks, she sank four cargo ships destined to supply Rommel's army and disabled an Italian destroyer. Back in Algiers Harbour, the piratical duel raised the Jolly Roger. Late in December 1942, Seraph was assigned to another secret mission, reconnaissance of the Mediterranean island of La Galite, 55 miles north of the African coast. The island was occupied by German and Italian troops, and was used as a lookout post to monitor the movements of Allied ships. Jules mission, codenamed Operation Peashooter, was to reconnoiter the island in secret and establish whether it could be successfully attacked by a commando force led by an American, Colonel William Orlando Darby of the U.S. Army Rangers. On December 17th, Jules sent off for Galita with Bill Darby as his passenger. The two Bills struck up an immediate friendship, which was hardly surprising, since Darby was, in Jules' words, a two-fisted fighting man, with a taste for danger that matched Jules' own. The Rangers were the counterpart to Britain's commandos, an elite and highly trained assault force. Formed in Northern Ireland under Darby's leadership in 1942, the Rangers had already distinguished themselves in North Africa by their courage and devotion to their leader. We'll fight an army on a dare. We'll follow Darby anywhere. At 31 years old, El Darbo, as his troops called him, gave the impression of having been hewn out of Arkansas granite. Three times in his career he spurned promotion in order to stay at the head of his troops, a varied crew that included a jazz trumpeter, a hotel detective, a gambler, and several toughened coal miners. At Arzu in North Africa, Darby had led the first Ranger battalion into battle, hurling hand grenades in the face of heavy machine gun fire always conspicuously at the head of his troops. On the way to La Galite, Darby regaled Jewel and his crew with ribald stories. For two days, the Seraph prowled around the island, charting possible landing spots, while the American took photographs. I think we can do it, declared Darby. Eventually, it was ruled that no troops could be spared for the assault on La Galite, and Operation Peashooter was called off, but not before Darby got a taste of Jewel's methods. All friendly forces had been cleared from the operational area, and Jules' orders invited him to sink on sight any vessel. On the way back to Algiers, he rammed one U-boat underwater and attacked another with three torpedoes, one of which failed to detonate on impact, and the other two of which veered off target, owing to the damage sustained in the earlier collision. Even the unshakable Darby found the experience of underwater combat alarming, telling Jewel, "'Put me ashore,' Give me a gun, and there isn't anyone or anything I won't face. But gee, Bill, I haven't been so scared in my life as in the last two days. The Seraph had sustained serious damage to her bows, and her crew was suffering from the constant strain, as became apparent when two former friends fell out, and one grabbed a large, evil-looking carving knife from the galley and tried to stab the other in the back. The Seraph was ordered to return home for rest, recuperation, and repairs. On the return journey... The submarine was attacked once again by a flight of Allied bombers. The repairs at Blythe Dockyard had reset the submarine's broken nose, giving the Seraph a lithe, graceful look. A cartoon of Ferdinand the Bull was painted on her conning tower, a reference to the children's story about the bull who shunned the bullring, a nickname reflecting the fact that Seraph spent more time on special missions than on operational patrols. As the Seraph made toward Huelva, Jewel was itching for another scrap but knew he must avoid contact with the enemy if possible. We were told that we were not going to be required to attack anything, as this was more important. The RAF had issued strict instructions to aircraft not to attack any submarines on the route, and naval intelligence confirmed that there were no known enemy vessels in the Gulf of Cadiz. But then, west of Brest, about midway through the voyage, the submariners heard a noise they all knew and dreaded the unmistakable sounds of a submarine being depth-charged. Somewhere, very close at hand, a duel was underway. We knew that at least one of our boats was in the vicinity, wrote Lieutenant Scott, and as each series of explosions hit our pressure hull like a hammer, despite the distance, we feared for the safety of our friends. Duel had his orders, and the Seraph continued south. Scott returned to war and peace. At the precise moment, Bill Jewell was uncharacteristically turning his back on a fight, Ewan Montague and Jean Leslie were preparing to go out to the theatre and dinner for the last time as Bill Martin and his fiancée, Pam.
Chapter 14 Bill's Farewell Ewan Montague had been planning Bill Martin's farewell party for some time, but he did not tell Jean Leslie until the afternoon of April 22nd. He sent a note from Bill, inviting Pam to see the variety star Sid Field in Strike a New Note at the Prince of Wales, to be followed by dinner at the Gargoyle Club. The MI5 secretary was thrilled by the invitation from her office admirer. I rushed home, changed out of office clothes, and threw on some makeup. Chumley had bought four tickets for the evening performance. That way they could demonstrate that the tickets had been bought in a block, even though the counterfoils of the two in the middle were missing and already en route to Spain in a dead man's pocket. Wasting the tickets, Montague later wrote, would have been absurd. Besides, it was an ideal opportunity to continue the courtship of his imaginary fiancée. Charles Chumley's date for the evening was Avril Gordon, another young secretary in the office who'd helped Hester Leggett compose Pam's letters. Both women were in the loop on Operation Mincemeat, although ignorant of its details. Montague remained firmly in character. The death of Bill Martin, presumed drowned at sea following an air crash, would shortly be announced but in the meantime Montague composed a personal tribute to him to be published in the Times in due course. The ruse would have to be maintained and reinforced long after Mincemeat had landed. The notice reads like a description of the man Montague would have liked to have been, the desk-bound literary genius who insists on fulfilling his patriotic duty, only to die tragically. The fake obituary was never published, but it offers a fascinating insight into the spymaster's level of emotional involvement. Bill Martin's death on active service came as a complete surprise to many of his friends when it was announced in your columns. Few of them knew that he had for some time been serving with the commandos where hitherto unsuspected qualities had been revealed. Martin was a unique personality, and his loss is tragic. An ever-growing number of his more discerning contemporaries were convinced that he had genius. He made Little Market School— where he was more interested in his own reading and music than in the normal work and athletics of his friends. After a university career during which he impressed, with his literary talents and qualities of leadership, a small circle of dons and college friends, he retired into the country to farm, fish and write. On the outbreak of war, Martin, who had already been profoundly stirred by the growing menace to all that he loved most deeply, hastened to offer his services to his country. He found himself placed in an office job, and although it was an important one and well suited to his talents, the determined, if unorthodox, efforts which he made to escape and prepare himself for more active and dangerous work were ultimately successful. As to others of an imaginative and artistic temperament, Martin's experiences with the commandos had brought a new meaning into life, an immense stimulus to creative activity. He had refused, until the war was over, to publish any of his work. We will therefore have to wait some time before a wider public can appreciate his rare talent. The two couples made an attractive sight as they entered the Prince of Wales Theatre. The men in full uniform, the women in their best dresses and heels. Montague handed the tickets to an usherette. We were terribly agitated when she tore the tickets, said Jean. Would she notice that two were missing? She did, and summoned the manager, who accepted that the middle counterfoils had been torn off as a joke. The lights dimmed, and the four settled into the plush seats of the circle to watch Sid Field open his new show. A veteran performer, Field had toured the provincial music halls for thirty years, singing, dancing, and performing comic skits. He had recently broken into the big time, playing the part of Slasher Green, a cockney bruiser. Strike a New Note was his first West End appearance, and he was supported by a group of young theatrical hopefuls, gathered from every part of the country— performing together as George Black and the Rising Generation. Black, a theatrical impresario, is today as obscure in public memory as Sid Field, but some of the Rising Generation rose very high indeed. Among the cast were two unknowns, Eric Morecambe and Ernie Wise, aged sixteen and seventeen respectively. Strike a new note had opened to rave reviews a month earlier. The Times had hailed Field as definitely a fine. The Daily Mail noted, The loudest laughter we have heard in years. The Daily Telegraph was gratified that all his jokes are clean. By April the show was playing to packed houses. Sid danced, told jokes, performed sketches and sang. I'm going to get pickled when they light up Piccadilly. I'm going to get pickled like I've never been before. In fact, Sid was already well pickled, since he never went on stage without an adequate ration of gin. 
Strike a new note was tailor-made escapism for wartime theatre-goers. Many in the audience were American G.I.s, and the satires on Anglo-American relations raised the loudest cheers. The war seemed impossibly distant, even irrelevant. A note on the back of the programme read, If an air raid warning should be received during the performance, the audience will be informed. Those desiring to leave the theatre may do so, but the performance will continue. The show ended with Sid's fan song. When you feel unhappy, and if you're looking blue, we recommend Sid Field to you. Even the cast seemed a little bemused by the rapturous audience reception. Jerry Desmond, Sid Field's straight man sidekick, wrote, The laughs came like the waves of a rough sea, breaking on a shingle beach. And when they came, they lasted. They lasted a long, long time. Eight hundred miles away, far out at sea, Lieutenant Scott stood on the deck of the Seraph listening to the waves breaking, and peered through the darkness toward the coast of Portugal. The weather was warm at last, and it was a delight to keep a watch on the bridge at night beneath a cloudless sky. 